We have five fantastic uh, papers lined up um, and uh, that, are, that are featuring in the new issue, issue one of 2023. Uh, most of the, the papers in this session are open access, but anyways, you can click uh, on, on the links presented in the program and read the papers. So you can access all of the, the, the papers on, uh, on our program. We have five papers, which means that each presenter has 17 minutes to present and about uh, five to seven minutes uh, at most for, for questions and comments. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Luca Oberti, uh, who is going to present a paper co-authored with Elodie Duarin, uh, and the paper is entitled The Feminization You, Cultural Norms and the Plow. So the floor is yours and I will uh, give you the heads up uh, about two minutes before you're supposed to stop. So please take it away, Luca. Look, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. Um, just a quick check to make sure that the screen is coming through and that you can see my slides. We well, can very... see it, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, uh, to present this newly published paper at this at this conference. Uh, so this is joint work with my former colleague uh, Elodie Duarain from uh, the uh, um, University College London. And uh, what we do in this paper uh, is to re-engage with the long-standing debate on the feminization U hypothesis um, in uh, uh, development economics. The feminization U hypothesis refers to the tendency of female labor supply to first drop and then rise back up again along the process of economic development. And um, this, um, uh, this relationship is illustrated by this diagram, which plots on the vertical axis the female labor force participation rate, so the share of the working age population of women that is economically active, against the log of GDP per capita on the, on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, across countries at least, this relationship holds. So there seems to be a U-shaped relationship between FLFP, female labor force participation, and, uh, and the level of, um, of economic prosperity across, across countries. Um, so as I said, this is a bit of a stylized fact of development economics, which goes all the way back to the seminal work of Esther Bozrup in the 1970s. Yet, however, recent evidence has cast some doubt on the empirical veracity of this uh, uh, of this hypothesis, and um, a recent influential paper by Gaddis and Klassen, for instance, claim that using dynamic panel data estimations, essentially there is no clear evidence for the feminization U hypothesis. So, motivated by this finding, what we do is to re-engage with this empirical controversy, and uh, we are essentially, or we think that we are the first to document a systematic source of heterogeneity in the income path of female labor supply. And in particular, we link this diversity of income paths of female labor supply to uh, social norms regarding the appropriate role of women in the economy and in, and in society. So we contribute to the empirical literature by identifying uh, a source of uh, heterogeneity in this uh, uh, in this relationship. So the literature has pointed to at least three theoretical mechanisms that generate the U curve related to structural change. So the transition from an agrarian to an industrial uh, and eventually onto a service based economy, the fertility transition and the gender education gap as as mechanisms that generate this U-shaped relationship in equilibrium. What we claim in this paper is that whether these mechanisms are actually operative depends on initial conditions. And in particular, it depends on the gender norms that obtain as an economy exits the Malthusian trap uh, and embarks on the process of, uh, of modern economic growth where per capita income begins to rise above subsistence. So in some, as an economy begins to travel down the feminization U, the shape of this feminization U that the economy will travel down on depends critically on the cultural endowments of this economy uh, at, time, at time T naught. And uh, we link this argument to, again, another argument which goes back to the seminal work of Esther Bozerup, but has been developed more recently by Alizina, 
um, which links the long run origins of gender norms to the type of agriculture uh, that was practiced in, uh, in, uh, in agrarian societies. And um, to operationalize empirically gender norms at time t naught, we again use this argument and kind of latch it onto the feminization new literature, um, showing that the type of agriculture that obtained uh, that was used the ancestrally determines the shape of the feminization new along along the process of development. And in this argument by by Alezina, which uh, the, goes back to Bozerup, as I said, there is a fundamental contrast between plow based agriculture and and hoe based. Uh, shift in cultivation. So in if the technology of agricultural production uses the plow, the argument is that men have a comparative advantage over women in agriculture. And the reason is that operating the plow requires a lot of upper body strength, forward thrust, uh, endurance, continuity of work. And uh, these are all qualities that arguably men are more biologically endowed with than, uh, than women. The men and women have equal quantity of brains, but men have more, have more brawn uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this model. So in plow-based um, societies, men have a comparative advantage over women. Uh, that generates a division of labor, which eventually become crystallized in, in gender norms that kind of normalize or institutionalize the role of men in the economy and the, and the role of women as, as homemakers. And Alezina and Bozrab contrast this type of uh, uh, agrarian societies with agrarian societies where agriculture relies on a more primitive uh, uh, technology such as the hoe and shifting cultivation. And in these societies, agriculture is based on handheld handheld tools, which are much lighter to uh, uh, to use and to and to operate. So in these societies, um, uh, male and female labor are closer substitutes. Men don't have a productivity and wage advantage over over women uh, in agriculture. So there is no division of labor, and over time, uh, there and um, that leads to no substantial difference. Uh, in the in the uh, in the way the role of men and women is is sort of culturally imagined. Uh, so what we claim, just to give you a quick preview of the results, is that the legacy of the plow exerts a moderating influence on the dynamics of female labor supply over the course of development. So what we expect is that in plow societies, the income path of FLFP should be strongly U-shaped, whereas in societies that historically did not use the plow. The path of LF, FLFP is predicted to be much more shallow uh, if U shaped uh, at all. So, just let me say a few more words about the the kind of theoretical framework uh, that motivates this this prediction. So, as I said, there are three main arguments uh, that uh, reproduce a U shaped relationship between female labor supply and the log of economic development. Uh, one of them, uh, which is the probably the the, the oldest links the uh, the u-shaped relationship to structural change so uh, sectoral shifts in production and employment as an economy moves from being ag agriculture based onto industrialization and onto a service-based economy and the argument here is that essentially women exit the labor force through the process of industrialization for a number of reasons but one of them is that factory jobs are considered to be dirty. So this is an argument that uh, that was um, first cast in these terms by Claudia Goldin. Um, so factory jobs attach stigma when the holders are, are women, and there are obviously reputational costs that lower the household utility where, where the woman works in a, in a factory. What we claim is that, and this is something that actually Claudia Goldin claimed herself, is that uh, this is all culturally contingent as it were. So in those societies that don't attach stigma to factory jobs for women, uh, the, we should expect a much less pronouncedly U-shaped relationship uh, uh, between uh, uh, FLFP and the log of income per capita because women are not expected are not expected to exit uh, the labor force and uh, and mass. So it all depends on the cultural norms that prevail in the economy. A second set of um, uh, arguments has linked the feminization new hy hypothesis to the fertility transition. And here the argument centers essentially on an income effect, uh, which claims that with economic development, there is, a, the, there is an increasing demand uh, for children. But what we, um, what we observed in the paper is that 
um, this argument implic implicitly relies on the existence of gender norms that allocate care labor unequally between men, men and women. So if care labor is considered to be the responsibility of women only, obviously an increase in the male wage um, will increase, will have a pure income effect on the demand of on the demand for children, causing women to exit the labor force. But if care labor is redistributed more equally across gender within the household, then an increase in the male wage with economic development won't have a pure income effect because the opportunity or time cost of children is also borne partly partly by men. So again, whether these mechanisms are operative and whether they generate a U-shaped relationship depends on the cultural norms that prevail. Uh, a recent paper by Hiller has also linked the feminization U to the gender education gap, so the male bias in access to education. So essentially, the household education budget is overwhelmingly used to educate boys uh, in this model, reading to a the leading to a widening of the productivity uh, of male and female labor and accentuating uh, the exit of women out of the labor force through the early stages of economic development. And in this model, the dependence on initial conditions and in particular on the cultural norms that prevail in the early stages of development is actually is actually made explicit. So all these uh, all these mechanisms predict a family of U curves that are effectively heterogeneous with respect to gender productivity difference and hence gender norms at time at time t naught and uh, to proxy for initial gender norms which are in turn determined by initial productivity differences between male and female labor we use the legacy of the plow and we predict the historical plow use will lead to larger gender productivity differences in ancestral societies more unequal gender norms over time and uh, a U-shaped relationship as an economy exits the um, the, the uh, Malthusian growth regime and begins to grow um, to grow economically with rising prosperity. In societies with no historical plow use, we have less of a productivity differential. Male and female labor are closer substitutes, so gender norms are ancestrally more equal. So as an economy exits the Malthusian trap and begins to grow economically above subsistence level the path of FLFP will be much, much less pronouncedly U-shaped. Uh, so we test this prediction uh, empirically, and we have a specification in which we regress female labor force participation on itself to account for uh, dependence and inertia, essentially, of gender norms, which underlie the uh, female labor supply decisions. Um, on the log of GDP per capita and the log of GDP per capita squared, which is the standard specification used in the literature to, st to test the feminization U. But the, um, the novelty of this specification is that we allow the parameters of the U curve to depend linearly on plow legacies. And that leads to a specification with interaction terms, and in particular, two interactions um, um, between log of GDP per capita in plow and log of GDP per capita squared and plow. Um, we include the time effects and country fixed effects sigma i, and that's the reason why you don't see uh, the main effect of the plow here in this specification, which is absorbed by, by the country fixed effect. So we can essentially estimate how the curvature of the U changes across context depending on historical plow legacies, but we cannot estimate how the U curve shifts up and down depending on, on plow lexis in this specific uh, fixed effects model. So as I said, FLFP is a number of women in the labor force as a percentage of the working age population. Uh, we, we use um, data from, from the ILO. Uh, the log of GDP per capita is PPP adjusted. And the plow is a measure that we take as it is from Alesina, which measures the fraction of the present day countries population whose ancestors practice plow agriculture. So they go through anthropological and ethnographic records to construct a, uh, to construct this variable, which ranges between uh, zero and one, one referring to countries in which uh, the 100% uh, of the present day population had ancestors that practice the plow and zero referring to countries uh, whose ancestors never, never used the plow. I'm not going to say more about this variable because I assume it's quite well known by uh, by this particular audience. We also condition on a number of potential observable confounders, which I'm not going to go through in details. But let me say something about the results. And just a quick check, 
uh, to make sure that you can still see the uh, my screen and that the table is reasonably uh, the visible. Uh, yes, uh, we can see very well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. So what you can see here um, is that the parameters beta one and beta two, which are the parameters of the U curve when plow equals zero, are always insignificant and in the interpretation across specifications. Um, and what this uh, what this shows is that in countries uh, whose ancestors never practiced the plow, the relationship between FLFP and the log of GDP per capita over time uh, is essentially indistinguishable from a from a flat line. Um, but if we sum uh, beta one with gamma one and beta two with gamma two, we obtain the parameters of the feminization U curve in contexts where plow equals one. So in the countries whose ancestors historically used the plow, and here you can see that in those countries, the time path of FLFP, so the relationship over time between FLFP and um, uh, the level of economic development is indeed significantly U-shaped. And the difference between uh, these two U-curves, which is measured by the coefficient on the, on the interaction terms is always statistically uh, significant. So there is a statistically significant, statistically significantly different relationship between these two variables in plow and non-plow countries. And this is represented diagrammatically. Um, and this diagram is based on a different type of specification uh, uh, based on split sample estimation rather than on a, uh, on a full specification with, uh, with interaction terms. Uh, so we also uh, conduct a, quite an extensive robustness analysis. In fact, the bulk of the paper is devoted essentially to testing the uh, robustness of this relationship empirically. This is, to a large extent, an empirical paper. Uh, and uh, we show that this relationship, the, that our findings are robust to correct infodynamic panel bias using a system GMM estimator instead of different um, uh, difference GMM. These were OLS results, by the way. Uh, the results are also robust to controlling for the endogeneity of GDP per capita to FLFP using internal instruments in a GMM style. We use alternative measures of historical plow use, and we also control for alternative potential effect modifiers. And so in this paper, we think of historical plow use as an effect modifier, as a, as a variable that exerts a modifying influence on the shape of the feminization U. We also control for other potential historical factors that may have exerted an effect modifying influence on, on this relationship. Uh, and we find that they're all insignificant and that the effect modifying influence of the plow is, uh, is always robust uh, to controlling for other potential effect modifiers. So in conclusion, the shape of the feminization U is found to be highly heterogeneous. And to our best knowledge, this is the first paper that documents a heterogeneity in, uh, uh, in this relationship. And we find that there is a, a systematic dependence uh, of this relationship on initial cultural norms as proxied by historical, historical plow use. So what are the main contributions in, in conclusion? So we integrate two strands of the literature, uh, the one on the feminization U and the one on the origin and the transmission of gender or cultural norms that have kind of developed on a, on parallel tracks in uh, in the in the literature, um, we claim that we make some progress in explaining the empirical controversy uh, surrounding the feminization U because it's possible that the studies that uh, identified a null effect uh, or a null relationship between FLFP and log of in income per capita did so because of the preponderance of non-plow countries in the sample. And lastly, we claim that we are, in a way, qualifying Alizina's argument because the effect of uh, historical plow use uh, in our results is only significant in countries at the middling level of development. So the effects of the plow, in a way, are neither immediate nor permanent. It takes time before an economy travels down the feminization U and reaches the middle income band for the influence of the plow to, uh, to show up. And then this influence is completely reversed as an economy develops. So there is no difference essentially between plow and no plow countries 
um, uh, holding uh, holding constant the level of development at a high at a high uh, uh, income level. So we claim that this is also in a way a qualification of Alizina's argument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca and uh, Elodie. We have uh, a couple of uh, minutes for uh, questions. Uh, there has been one in in the chat. Um, um if if you want to speak up uh, you can you can ask your question or i can read it out loud the um, plow legacy why should this uh, effect remain over time beyond the time beyond the time a country has uh, an essentially agricultural economy does the effect decline over time this is something that that you spoke to just now does the intensity of uh, tractor use and its time of widespread introdu introdu introduction matter does it differ across countries according to the proportion of output accounted for by agriculture? So uh, would you like to respond, uh, Luca or LOG to, to the questions? Oh, uh, is the LOG online? Uh, well, you can uh, just respond. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, yes, uh, I think that these are largely questions for the late Alezina. Uh, uh, in a way. So why should the uh, effect remain uh, uh, over time? Uh, well, in, Alizina, in Alizina's argument or in Bozerup's argument, the effect uh, persists over time essentially because of the intergenerational transmission of, of preference. So there is a historical sh uh, his, uh, shock, uh, the introduction of this technology, which occasions a division of labor, which becomes crystallized in uh, cultural norms that emerge as a result. And then these cultural norms are passed down across generations uh, uh, through uh, family uh, mechanisms of socialization. So this is the mechanism in Alesina. Uh, does the effect uh, decline over time? Uh, yes, I suppose there is uh, in the in the original argument, there is some uh, um, uh, um, uh, decline in the magnitude of the effect over time implicitly in Alizina's, uh, Alizina's analysis is, is cross-sectional, so they don't show this explicitly. In our case, as I, uh, as I said, the, um, we, in, a, in identifying a heterogeneity in the shape of the U-curve, we are also at the same time qualifying this argument because if the feminization U is, is present only in plow countries, but the relationship between FLFP uh, and income is effectively flat in non-plow countries. The difference between U-curves, which measures the effect of the plow shock is only large and non-zero effectively at middling levels of development, but the effect initially is zero. And as an economy uh, reaches the uh, high income band, the effect is effectively nullified. Uh, with the, the interesting, interesting point, thank you about the introduction of the tractor uh, technology, so mechanization in agriculture, we haven't uh, uh, followed followed through that that line of thinking, but we should actually. That's that's a nice suggestion. Thank you very much, and maybe one uh, follow up question, uh, short one from from the audience. Well, maybe just uh, if there is no one who would like to ask, or maybe. For me, I would abuse my power as chair. What about the uh, female labor force participation? Um, so the, the informal labor force uh, participation, have you thought about that and accounted for that uh, in your analysis? Um, um, well, we haven't because we just rely in a way on uh, the ILO having done this in, when uh, when compiling uh, the the estimates of female labor force participation, um, which I suppose should reflect uh, participation, for instance, in uh, informal agriculture. So when women work on family plots, for mm -hmm. instance, critically, mm -hmm. that is considered to be uh, um, uh, female labor force participation. And when when the household member works as as unpaid aid on the, on the family farm. Uh, that is considered to be female labor force mm -hmm. participation. So, yeah, and and this is critical, obviously, at this, you know, in in this. Oh, sorry, in this, in the low income region. Mm -hmm. in the, yeah, in this region, yeah, mm -hmm. where agriculture is dominant. 
Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any further questions for LED or for Luca, feel free to get in touch with them. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the interesting and insightful presentation, Luca and LED, and congratulations on, on your publication. Mm -hmm. We have next uh, uh, Matlu Piracha and Max Tani with their co-authors, um, uh, who is going to present the paper, Max or Matlu? Uh, yes, I'll try to present the paper. Oh, okay. Hi, Max. Yeah. Hi, hi. Hi from Sydney tonight. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, share the screen at the presentation. <clears throat> Sure, and I will introduce you in uh, you introduce the paper in the meantime. So uh, the paper is entitled "Social Assimilation: Immigrants' Labor Market Outcomes," uh, and it is open access, just as uh, uh, Luca and Elogie's paper. So, Max, um, yeah, let, me, let me just. Uh, I'm having uh, okay. There should be a green button button yeah, yeah, at the bottom is, of the uh, screen. It's just the difficulty of picking up the right. Uh, the right screen oh yeah <laughs> nice screen it should be here and let's see yeah. how this goes if you guys yeah can that. yeah That's we can see it yeah please take it away Excellent. so the floor is yours <laughs> thanks very much and thanks uh, everyone for attending tonight um as Milena uh, mentioned this is joint work with uh, Matt Lugus here and also two uh, colleagues um, who are not far from me. Uh, one is Chiming Cheng um, from the same university, University of New South Wales, and Bang Wong from Macquarie University. Paper is called Social Assimilation and Immigrants Labor Market Outcome, and uh, you can find this online um, at the bottom. What is that we're trying to do? Well, there is a very large literature on uh, what outcomes migrants get when they migrate. But there is comparatively less information and less literature on how these outcomes are achieved. Part of this reflects what is collected on surveys in terms of data. So um, they tend to collect uh, you know, the employment status, uh, some demographics, some personal characteristics, uh, uh, what people do in the labor market, their wage, their occupation, where they live, um, a little bit less on employer and even less on the circumstances which lead to the outcome that we actually observe. And so um, a number of researchers uh, look at qualitative surveys, uh, qualitative data, which are insightful, but they are fairly hard to replicate and even more difficult to, to generalize. Um, however, uh, a number of uh, uh, surveys or important uh, data sources also collect uh, uh, subjective information uh, which uh, has value, which contains information. And this is what we're trying to do, to try to um, extract some information that can be insightful about the process of uh, uh, immigration in why people achieve certain outcomes. Um, and to do that, we focus particularly on social assimilation or ethnic identity, which we use uh, interchangeably. What is it? Well, it's basically how migrants identify, generally self-identify in terms of the values, the beliefs, the tradition, the habits, and so forth, or how they tend to be seen. There is work that uh, uh, supports, provides evidence, uh, and uh, Klaus and Amelie are, uh, you know, provide some of the earliest work in, in this area. They show that this uh, assimilation and this identity is important um, for improving or to achieve certain outcomes. Some of the reason could be um, just individual base uh, or migrant specific, like they give more confidence or less confidence, resilience uh, or self motivation. But also, um, it establishes a number of bridges uh, or commonalities with the the identity or the prevailing identity uh, in the in the host country. 
The results of this literature are still highly dependent on the type of country and the study, um, also because countries are very different in the way in which they allow immigrants um, to, to move in. Some countries are quite open and uh, allow people to uh, basically uh, resettle because of uh, family or because they study or because they uh, have work or um, other reasons. In other cases, uh, and increasingly, countries tend to select uh, migrants, certainly economic migrants, and uh, it has been observed that that has some effect on the on the outcomes uh, for uh, for migrants. Specifically, what is that we do? Well, we try to provide some basic questions about the relevance of this. Ethnic, we call it ethnic identity or, or assimilation um, in labor-related uh, outcomes in a country. And some of them are hard outcomes, like probability of getting a job, but others are softer outcomes, like um, you know, uh, happiness or the quality of the job or over or under uh, unemployment or the sense of security that people have in a job. Um, and then we do uh, make a contribution which we haven't seen so far, but um, it's an idea, it's a hypothesis that follows some uh, evidence in the literature, which is um, migrants are very often a cushion for native employment uh, over the cycle, over the economic cycle. And the data that we have do contain a very big shock, which is called global financial crisis. And so what we want to do um, we want to see the effect that being more or less socially integrated has on uh, some labor market outcomes in the host country, in this case, Australia, in which we try to, um, to see that by gender. The data that we use is uh, uh, a panel uh, that, that is one of the most um, used so far in um, analysis uh, of migrants and non-migrants uh, in Australia and also beyond, because it follows about 20,000 people uh, for now, uh, just over 20 years. There is an annual um, survey which is done. Some people sort of enter and exit uh, the surveys, but it, there is quite a good um, sample which is followed over time. And some of the questions are um, extremely detailed. Um, and also repeated over time. Um, we, in this particular study, we follow about 17,000 individuals over 18 years, and uh, we have a number of information on, on their characteristics, as well as you know, how they feel uh, in, in other um, sort of uh, traits or features that the that, that people have. So the big question is, okay, that's, that's a nice idea, but how do we actually identify what is that we're trying to do, which is this sense of being part or feeling part of the community or the society in which one uh, ends up. Uh, for this, we take guidance from, from Kraus and Amelie's work. Um, and what they do in their particular work, they have information on migrants from both the country of origin and the country of destination, and they are able to build an index that contains information across a set of indicators on this. We don't have that. We only have information from the country of destination, but we capture a number of aspects which are not just uh, um, self-assessments um, of life in Australia. So one is language. The other one is um, the sense of being happy or comfortable in living in Australia and be completely uh, agreed it is totally uh, endogenous, and so we, we, we include and we exclude it from, from our um, uh, regressions. <clears throat> and also an element of uh, um, concentration in terms of where people live. Um, and so whether the migrants live in a highly or not so highly um, immigrant area. The index that is the result of, of combining these three variables, uh, we call it uh, assimilation index, and is positively related with, with assimilation in the sense that the higher value uh, implies uh, that people are better uh, with their English 
uh, happier in living in Australia, and they tend to live in an area that does not have as many immigrants as other uh, parts uh, or locations uh, in the country. There are some numbers, I will not go through those, but just uh, uh, you know, to, to, to give you um, a sense uh, of, of what's happening in Australia. Just in terms of happiness, uh, um, in the scale of 0 to 10, uh, Australia or, or the people interviewed in Hilda tend to score quite high. So it's about seven. So by and large, people are uh, happy, or at least they've been happy so far. Um, with what the uh, situation is. In terms of our index, uh, the index uh, has values between zero and three, and we have uh, uh, an average value of about two. So what do we do with that? Well, um, we apply, uh, since we have a panel, uh, a panel uh, sort of technique, it's uh, not, entirely a fixed effect. It's almost a fixed effect in the sense that we use a random effect models, but then we put the average uh, over time of uh, the time varying variables. Um, and uh, we applied this uh, particular regression to a set of labor market indicators, and uh, these are the Ys, um, and uh, we use as main variable our index, but also the individual components and the paper shows the results both on each individual component as well as on the index, which summarizes that. So I just want to show you the results first, and then um, I go back to try to tell you what is happening and why we think this paper uh, matters also in terms of, of, of policy and uh, um, future research. So we find surprise, surprise, or maybe not so surprised, that uh, uh, on average, people who have a higher score in this assimilation index tend to are more like tend to be more likely to have a job, tend to be happier about that job and the pay that comes with it and the security that goes with it, and they're also better matched on the job in that uh, they are less likely to have a level of education above what is required. Uh, a small note here. Australia has a selective immigration policy. By and large, economic migrants tend to have a degree. And so um, Australia has an issue with overeducation simply because the vast majority of legal economic migrants who were about 60% of migrants uh, with the data and a little bit less nowadays um, have a university degree or above. In terms of the characteristics that are a bit softer with reference to uh, sort of labor market, um, we find that there is a distinction between um, males and females in the sense that um, females score a little bit less well relative to males. And so rather than being less likely uh, to be uh, overeducated, we don't observe that uh, uh, in the females, but still uh, they are uh, uh, happy or relatively happy about uh, um, the job that they have. They're less likely to have uh, uh, better jobs in their education, uh, sort of um, sort of justifies. And these measures of over and under education are based on what the Australian Bureau of Statistics does, because it has thousands of jobs at six digit levels. And for each job, they assign one of five levels of education uh, that makes sense. So this is not our uh, impression of being over or under educated, but it's actually um, this, 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 this job is done for us by the ABS. In terms of wages, um, people who feel more assimilated uh, tend to have uh, higher wages. Now, the interesting aspect is to see what happens before and after the GFC, because uh, there is an effect, and even though Australia managed to survive the GFC, and uh, um, at the time, uh, policy intervention was swift and quick, uh, Australia still had a dip in growth around the, the um, you know, 2008, 2009. And what you observe, um, as 
the effect. The effect is that the labor market outcomes for uh, men tend to uh, worsen, but they're not so bad uh, before and after, um, especially for those who are assimilated or have higher score of assimilation. So assimilation does seem to capture some elements that makes men more likely to hang on to the job. Um, this is not the case for women where any statistical significance we observed prior to the GFC uh, disappears uh, after, uh, after the GFC. So for women, um, the shock was, was negative and uh, being more or less assimilated uh, made um, very little uh, difference. And that is um, obvious also when we look at uh, uh, the feeling of security and happiness, uh, and, you know, th those softer scores uh, about uh, uh, the labor market where we could observe a clear uh, pattern for, for women that totally disappears after, after the GSC. Then we try to understand, well, what is that uh, effect that we try to capture in these uh, um, indicators? Um, how does it manifest itself? And what we find, we find that it manifests itself mostly through um, the network that uh, one basically has, uh, either in terms of participating to social activities, in terms of having friends, in terms of being active even in the labor market, in terms of belonging to a trade union, or um, in terms of uh, um, you know, social activities. So um, there is something beyond that uh, element of uh, um, um, you know, language and culture and similarities that make people uh, in a way uh, better connected, not only to society, but to, uh, to, uh, to the labor market. And from here, or at least from these results, the two key points that one sees for um, research or for at least for policy are the following. The first one um, is that there is uh, a different response that goes on between uh, men and women. And therefore, um, one should be mindful of the fact that you know, uh, migrants are just not a poor resource or something that one should see as a, as a, as a unicorn, but, uh, but uh, there are males and females and they have different needs and they react differently. The other, and that has to be uh, clearly, uh, not only acknowledged, but actually shown uh, in studies. Uh, and the other element, which is perhaps the strongest, uh, is that when we think of, of policies, these policies tend to be normally uh, fairly hard and they are labor market specific in the sense of one should try to improve uh, language proficiency, one should improve access to the labor market, one should improve job search, one should improve this sort of um, clear or clearly definable um, sort of uh, policy uh, targets or objectives. There is much less uh, discourse, and maybe because it is, is more difficult, it is more vague to, to define, on trying to create the conditions to facilitate assimilation, to generate opportunities for people who come from different parts of the world to interact, to be able to um, meet other people, uh, either migrants or natives, uh, because in that way, um, there is a better uh, or if you want an externality that occurs, uh, which is also measured and picked up by a uh, typical economics variable. And this is an area that is, um, personally, I feel under research, uh, where uh, the interest of, of policymakers seemed to have stopped, at least in this country, about 20 years ago, when there was a lot of, of sense, or there were a lot of discussion of a multicultural uh, place where there was an effort in trying to um, generate bridges from people of different communities, that discourse is, is gone. And it wouldn't be surprising to see that as a result, we have 
uh, more fragmented society, even among immigrants, and as a result, communities of immigrants that start behaving a bit uh, independently. That's all I have to say, or I want to say, and uh, I'm open to any questions or comments that, that you may have. Thanks very much. Thank Thank you very much, uh, Max, uh, for this uh, fascinating presentation. And I must uh, applaud you on uh, using subjective and objective uh, measures side by side in such an effective way. We have one uh, question from, am I pronouncing your name uh, correctly, Geraint? Yeah, Geraint. Uh, Geraint. Geraint. Uh, yeah, Geraint. Very, very interesting paper, Max. Um, I'm interested in your interpretation of assimilation because uh, a lot of what you've got in there uh, one might think of as other forms of human capital. So English language for people in Australia, you might just be picking up the effect on earnings and employment of being able to speak English well. And the, the social clubs side, I wondered if there was any way you could separate out um, general social clubs where people might mix with the indigenous population from clubs that are you know, like when, when I moved from Wales to England, I joined a Welsh society, and that's not helping me in assimilation, right? Okay, with, with reference to the first, for, uh, thanks so much for this. With reference to the first, uh, for the fir first point, uh, we think uh, that we do capture more than what a single indicator does, in the sense that the, the paper shows it, right? I just did, didn't do it here. But we run the regression using the indicator separately. So just looking at different elements of human capital and then looking at them together. And uh, the sum in the indicator is more than the individual elements. So it is not just uh, language profici proficiency. It is not just education. It is not just uh, the culture you have. Uh, for example, I don't understand cricket at all. So that. You know, I, I cannot communicate with, uh, um, you know, 90% of, of Australian natives. I don't know how to score, uh, or, you know, the, the scoring is done. Uh, you know, Matrum can help on this and is, is you know, is great to work with other people, but I, I just can't, can't do that. Um, so, no, it's not just human capital. I think it's, it's beyond. Um, one thing that we didn't do, and I think could be an interesting compliment, interesting compliment is that uh, Hilda contains a lot of uh, psychological variables uh, that also relate to personality. And uh, um, I think that uh, this assimilation is not much of an input, but an output of your culture, your language ability, your expression, but also a lot of these psychological elements uh, that, uh, that go with it. So, you know, are you... Uh, a warm person, are you a cold person? Do you have a sense of humor? Do you, uh, you know, have a strong personality, or or you're more reserved, and so forth? With reference to clubs, unfortunately, we don't have that. I tell you, um, we we would love to have um, more detail on exactly what uh, what is going on, um, because. In, uh, I came to Australia 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago. Um, and every community, in a way, has its own club. So the equivalent of the Welsh club in, in England exists still as well. But they were open clubs. So you were going, as an Italian of origin, I would go to the Greek club to eat a certain thing. And then I would go to the Indian club to eat something else. And then there is the, the event in the other. And it was absolutely wonderful. And at the time, there was a lot of uh, um, uh, discussion on, on multiculturalism, which seems to be to, to have somewhat disappeared. Uh, only the economic variables remain important, nothing else. And even these clubs nowadays, because they sit on very valuable land, become you know, skyscrapers, they're removed, they, they are changed. They are, so you can see both in the society, but also in the physicality of how the space is organized, that the opportunities to interact are more limited. People have to make a choice, they have to specialize. And I think it's a personal view to be tested that this is detrimental um, to choices that are made. So 
uh, not so much as an individual, but intergenerationally. And so it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, uh, the, the level of, of assimilation that parents feel um, is somewhat maintained or, uh, or not uh, going down the line. Thank you very much, Max. Unfortunately, I have to uh, stop this interesting conversation uh, because we are limited in time, but hopefully to be continued. Our next presenter is unfortunately not here, but uh, we will have uh, the presenter after that. We'll no, switch uh, the sorry, I am, I am, I am, I, I am. Ah, you made it. Okay, yeah, Vincenzo, you know, hi. There was, uh, there was okay. uh, a shutdown in the connection in office, but uh, oh, okay. okay. Okay, uh, so there has been sorry. some uh, some side communication, but anyways, we're back on track. So Thank we'll have much. next uh, Vincenzo uh, Lombardo presenting. And yes. the title of the paper is Social Identity and Labor Market Outcomes of Immigrants. So very much dovetailing with what we have been talking about just until now. So Vincenzo, please, the floor is yours. So okay. Take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for hosting. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, okay. Thank you. Let me, let, sorry, just a moment because I did. Okay. 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 Okay, let me do something like this. Something, okay. Where is, uh, okay, should be this one. Okay, okay, sorry. Again, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear, okay, uh, hear see. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a joint paper with uh, two co-authors, Maria Rosaria Carillo and Tiziana Veritelli, very close to the uh, Massimiliano previous paper uh, about uh, the process of identification of the immigrants in Italy and their uh, labor market performance. Let me uh, thank uh, the editor in charge of our paper, Professor Zimmerman, for uh, his guidance to the revision process, as well as the referees. So what is the paper about? Essentially is asked for the context of Italy, what kind of social identity affects uh, most, uh, the most immigrants' economic performance, economic success. Uh, immigrants arriving in a place, in some, uh, they usually choose and they redefine themselves in terms of the culture, uh, the cultural origin and the culture of the country of arrival. So in this paper, we ask how acceptance or, of uh, rejection of cultural norms and values of societies of arrival and origin contribute to the labor market performance of immigrants in Italy. And they, uh, we, uh, after this, we try to make uh, an exercise, exercise to analyze the mechanism through which this type of identification process may affect the labor market performance. Um, what we show in our paper is, is this. Uh, not only identification with OSCAD, that is not only the process of assimilation of immigrants towards the culture of the country of destinations, but also the retainment of, uh, and the attachment to their country of origin culture um, affect uh, strongly and positively their uh, uh, labor market uh, uh, employment probabilities. In particular, uh, using a framework which uh, I go back in a second, uh, which uh, uh, assumed that the process of identification uh, is a, a multiple uh, framework uh, story, we show that immigrants who simultaneously identify with both home and host country culture have the highest probability of employment, while different from most of the literature, uh, assimilated immigrants who only identify with the host country culture do not have a net occupational advantage. The mechanism through which this uh, we find this result, we show that the effects are triggered uh, by the different types of network. We focus essentially on type of friends and association that immigrants join. Uh, this type of network 
have uh, the, uh, the, the effect of this type of network have on uh, the different social identities that immigrants choose to, uh, to adopt. Uh, Okay, this is a very big uh, slide about literature. Just uh, let me point out two, uh, two essential big uh, story to highlight our contribution. The um, most, uh, most part of the literature um, focuses on the idea that uh, labor market outcomes of, e of immigrants are mostly shaped by their assimilation to the country destination culture. Uh, to the attachment to the host country, while re the retainment of a strong ethnic identity of a, uh, has no effects or detrimental impact on the employment probability of the immigrants. Uh, this uh, the literature focuses on uh, mainly on assimilation uh, indexes like years spent in the essential place, intermarriage. Then there is another part of the literature, big part of the literature, um, focusing on the idea that uh, the process of identification contains multiple social identities. That is, uh, these immigrants when uh, have to uh, start on the identification process and may either choose to adopt both multiple identities, in our case, just to the identification towards the, the place of destination, the identification of, uh, uh, toward the place of uh, origin. Uh, and this, in these frameworks, there is, uh, we adopt a framework based on this idea of the acculturation strategy, that is that identities are intertwined to form a complex social identities. And in this literature, the results are mixed. Sometimes individuals retain both identities, both host home identities, have a labor market performance higher than assimilated individuals, in other contexts, no. Then the, the other contribution of our paper is to highlight, to make a huge effort on trying to highlight the mechanism, as a recent paper by Kain Zimmerman and Piracio and Massimiliano paper, just uh, paper, uh, try to highlight. So just let me go through rapidly. Uh, I don't, I'm not going in detail on the data. We use a survey, a very representative survey uh, from Italy uh, containing um, information on uh, immigrants, uh, 12,000 12, immigrants from uh, uh, 127 countries origin. This is mostly our countries uh, poorer than, uh, than Italy. And our contexts are cities, municipalities, very, uh, some very small, some other biggest municipalities across, uh, across Italy. What, uh, why we use this survey? Because um, this survey has, uh, contains two questions, uh, subjective questions that we use as our main variables to, uh, to uh, identify the identity of the immigrants. This question asks, how much do you feel to belong to Italy and to your country of origin? Then we build two dummies, host identity and home identity. Uh, and we use this uh, uh, dummies as our main variable. These are two subjective self-identification uh, uh, variable of, uh, of, of the immigrants. Then we use also other, other variables for robustness, more objective variables, uh, like uh, the Italian language, use of the Italian language at home, or the intermarriage rate, and results are robust throughout the um, the variable user. What we do with these two, with these two uh, identity variable? We assess the, how much, first of all, this identification will affect the employment prospect of the immigrants. And then we build in term, uh, using the taxonomy of this uh, cross-cultural psychology literature, the acculturation strategy, the idea that in accepting or rejecting the cultural destination country, um, immigrants simultaneously choose also to preserve or abandon the country region culture and vice versa. So that uh, be, uh, uh, between the, uh, through the cross tabulation of these two ident identities, the home identity, that is how much immigrants feel to belong to the country or region or to host identity, how much immigrants feel to belong to Italy, we can have this kind of individuals integrated, in which in our sample are mostly 50%, uh, are those who contemporaneously 
continuously retain their country origin culture, they feel, to, they feel attached to their country origin culture, but and contemporaneously assimilate to the to the to Italy. Uh, vice versa, assimilated ones are those who choose only to assimilate to the uh, to the to Italy to the country destination while abandoning their uh, country of the origin culture, they do not feel to uh, attach to the country of essential culture. On the other side, we have separated in immigrants who uh, vice versa uh, choose not to assimilate to the country of destination, Italy, but to only retain uh, their country of origin culture. And the last one are marginalized, which do not have any kind of identity. So what do we do with this kind of idea? Um, we have a bunch of outcomes. Our main outcome is the employment probability of immigrants. Then we have a bunch of other outcomes to analyze mechanism and other results. And our main uh, specification is, is a, simple, a simple regression, which we have the outcome of immigrants I from country region O in city in Italy C, and we have this uh, home identity, host identity, and their interaction. We have a bunch of individual control, huge, a, a lot of fixed effects, country origin time uh, seat, Italian city fixed effects. We also have a very tight estimation identification use a, using the age at arrival and years in Italy cohorts. That is, we analyze the difference between immigrants arrived at the same age and in Italy for the same period, uh, same years in, um, so we are a very tight identification. And what we do? We first analyze in a, in a parsimonious model how much the home identity and host identity affects the employment probability of the immigrants. Then, you, using the full saturated model, we back up the what how much the different strategy of identification may affect the um, the employment probability. In particular, having uh, the marginalized immigrants those who do not have any identification process as a base category, we can use the linear combination of the uh, three of these three coefficients to, to get the, uh, the probability of the integrated individual who, who are those who contemporaneously feel to belong to both countries of origin and Italy. And uh, this is our integrated, that is the linear combination of beta one, beta two, and beta three. And in the same fashion, we can back up the, also the, um, the uh, coefficient, the impact for the other uh, immigrants. Seemingly, we can uh, use the linear combination to look at difference in terms of employment probability between integrated and assimilated. That is the difference between immigrants who choose to contemporaneously uh, adapt to both, to identify with both uh, country destination and arrival uh, culture with respect to assimilated ones, which only uh, uh, choose to ad adapt to the country of destination culture while retaining, while abandoning that of uh, origin. Uh, just to go uh, through the results, and I'll try to explain a little better uh, with more calm the results. Okay, in the first three columns, we do not include the interaction, just we look at the impact of the single the single identities on the labor market outcome on the employment status of the immigrants. And just already the first results show that there is a positive correlation between the ethnic identity of the immigrants and the employment status. This is not very common in the literature, not very common results in the literature. The very common results in the literature is this one in column two, in which the assimilation, the host identification is positively cor correlated. And these results are robust even when we control for both identities together. Then we use in, introduce the interaction term and in the, in the full separated modeling of column four, what we do observe that still home and host identities, both process of, the, of identification with the country origin and destination are positively correlated with the employment status while the interaction term is negatively correlated. The negatively correlated effects it may imply, may uh, implies that in the process of maintaining both the identities, 
origin and arrival, there are some costs for immigrants in terms of uh, time to, uh, to join both kind of groups, origin and arrival, in terms of learning, language, and so on and so forth. N nonetheless, the benefits of joining both groups that of origin and that of arrival are still larger than this, uh, this cost. What we see is that when we look at uh, linear combination, integrated immigrants who contemporaneously retain their country origin culture while joining the country destination group <coughs> have a really positive effects Employment, uh, employment premium. This is still more important when we look at the difference between integrated and assimilated. What we see that immigrants who retain their country origin uh, culture uh, with respect to those the assimilated that instead abandon their country origin culture have an employment premium. This results, in, which is very uncommon in the literature, implies that uh, the process, the, what really matters for the employment probability of immigrants in Italy is their contemporaneously attachment to both identities. Still, what we have in, uh, in, the, last, uh, in, in the last column is that these integrated imm immigrants have an employment premium also with respect to separated, which are those who only identify and retain their country and culture while not choosing to, to join the, the, the culture of the destination countries. And finally, another important result with respect to the literature is that there is no difference between assimilated and separated with respect to the employment probability. What does this mean is that essentially the only process of assimilation of adopting the country destination, in this case in Italy, uh, does not convey an, an employment benefits with respect to those that choose to retain only their country of culture. So these are our main, our main results. And this is the first part of the paper. And we did we do a lot of stuff to, uh, to make these uh, results really, really robust. We have a lot of robustness checks going through individual characteristics, sample selection, using other measures of social identities, uh, sorting, and say we try to to make these results robust to process of sorting of immigrants across cities, selection process, and so on and so forth. Just to go quick, next step in the paper is to, is to ask why we do find these results. So we have the idea that immigrants contemporaneously identify with both country of destination and origin culture have the highest employment performance, even though they retain, they have some cost in doing this. So the, uh, the question that we ask is why these integrated individuals who have both home and host identity have this uh, show this employment premium. And uh, to do this, we start with an heterogeneity analysis uh, to look at um, whether these integrated individuals uh, have, uh, there is some difference across individual characteristics. These first two columns is, are just baseline that says that integrated immigrants with respect now to all the others uh, uh, have an employment uh, premium, have an agas, an, agas, an agas probability of employment. Then we look at the difference between gender and um, while there is no huge difference, we still find, we find that a, within female group, integrated uh, women have an highest uh, employment probability than uh, uh, not integrated women with respect to the male counterpart. Then we look at uh, two groups uh, identified by the time uh, spent in Italy between short uh, time and, long, and longer time. And what we see is that among people, among immigrants who stay since short time in Italy, integrated immigrants have an uh, are have a negative employment probability with respect to not, not integrated ones, while these results does not emerge for who stayed since longer time. At the same, at the same time, we have this distinction between 
immigrants who arrived at old age or arrived young, and the same results hold for the low educated individual, while it does not emerge for highest educated individual. So these results, um, some, summing up, in some sense gives us the idea that the integration, the, the, despite the cost, the uh, adoption of both identities support the employment probability of the most vulnerable individual. In our sample are those that have just arrived in Italy, who arrived at the old age and the lowest educated one. This is awesome. So sorry, I will have to uh, ask you to conclude so that we can have uh, time maybe for one question or comment. Okay, just to conclude, we see, just to tell you that the same results I conclude with this that give you the, the idea. The what we do find is that uh, uh, these effects. Uh, uh, through comes through essentially to the network. What we find in our in our uh, in our uh, paper is just that that integrating immigrants have an higher probab probability of employment because the, they have a larger network. They uh, join network of friends of both the, uh, nationalities that enlarge the occupational probabilities. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for this interesting presentation. I think uh, this paper very nicely followed from, from uh, Max's paper. We have qu time for maybe one uh, question. I see already um, uh, Lucas' uh, hand up. Please, take it, please uh, ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really, really fascinating paper. I was just wondering whether your results come primarily from individual uh, variability or whether um, then, then from a group variability. So I'm thinking that some immigrant groups in Italy uh, are very walled in, say the Chinese community is really inward looking. Other uh, communities of foreigners, say the Albanian community are highly assimilated in Italian society and uh, Albanian immigrants who come to Italy tend to become Italian 100% and uh, erase their, uh, their home country's identity. So I was wondering, uh, the, you use some fixed effects, but maybe I missed the details. Uh, yeah, to, to, to sh thanks for the question. Two short uh, answers. First one, we use uh, city, by, city by country origin fixed effects. So identif identification comes uh, within same immigrant group living in the same city. Okay, okay, so okay. Other, then we also okay. have some robustness for uh, like cultural origins, linguistic distance, and so on and so forth. So variability identification does not come through um, variability across groups of immigrants. Across groups. In our okay. okay, thank you. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, uh, uh, I would uh, like to uh, ask to conclude this interesting uh, presentation, unfortunately, because we're um, uh, otherwise we will run out of time. And I would like to ask uh, our next presenter, who is Egbert Jongen, uh, who is going to be speaking about analyzing tax benefit reforms in the Netherlands using structural models and natural experiments. Um, to uh, present his paper. And I just realized that he is the only non-Italian presenter in the yeah. session. So that is an interesting thing. Uh, um, yeah, so Indeed, uh, I double checked as well. It was interesting to see. Um, it's very interesting, all these talks about uh, assimilation of immigrants. Actually, I'm also doing some work on that. So maybe for some oh. future time, uh, yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah, but uh, so, today please. about tax benefits. And uh, well, first of all, let me congratulate you, both Klaus and Milena. 35 years of general population economics, pretty fantastic. So I often use it uh, in my research. So happy to contribute to that as well. So let me try to share my screen. Uh, so I think you see my screen now, Milena? Yes, yes, Egbert, please. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so this paper is about uh, analysis of tax benefit reforms in the Netherlands, where we use both structural models and natural experiments. It's joint work with my colleague, uh, Henk Wim de Boer. We're both at CPB. So let me give you a little bit of 
background for why we did this paper. Well, first of all, so I work at, at CPB, which is like the fiscal watchdog of the Netherlands and simulating tax benefits reforms is really one of the core businesses uh, we do at CPB. And, and the Netherlands has this long tradition of analyzing election proposals of different political parties already since 1988, uh, where basically all the political parties, they hand in their proposals to CPB and then we calculate the effects on, let's say, employment, income inequality, uh, and other, uh, other outcomes. So it plays a pretty big role. And, um, and also like election times are the times when the major reforms happen in the tax benefit system. So, so there's quite a burden on us, so to say, to do a good job. And so this paper was the result of a lot of uh, effort we put in to improve the empirical basis, specifically of our labor supply analysis. And as, I said, as it says in the title, so we used both structural models and natural experiments. So I guess natural experiments uh, have some benefits in terms of identification, really getting at the causal effect of some reforms in the past. But if you want to do counterfactual policy reform, you need a structural model, at least if you want to have big, want to analyze big reforms, uh, which also use some results uh, of uh, later as well. So we use these uh, estimates of both structural model and natural experiments to make a simulation model. And then with the simulation model, we did a number of uh, policy analysis, uh, smaller ones and bigger ones. And I think especially some of the bigger ones are also interesting for international audience. So that's a little bit of background. Let me, so I don't have so much time. So I just want to give you what I think are some of the highlights of the paper. First of all, the structural model. So what, how, what does it look like? What is in it? Then uh, I'll show you one of the comparisons we did with the, where we compare the predictions of the structural model with the results from uh, some natural experiments analysis we did, and then I'll move on to considering the effects of small reforms and finally conclude some, uh, some uh, of the results for large reforms. So the structural model, uh, it's a discrete choice model for labor supply to keep it manageable in the tradition of Artie van Soest, another Dutch uh, great economist we all know quite well. Uh, so we assume that people have uh, discrete choices in their labor supply. They can decide either not to work, so zero days per week, up to one, two, three, four, five days a week. And if you have a couple, then both partners have this choice. So they can both choose whether they work zero up to five days. But also given that we had good data on the use of childcare, we also allow for a, cho a choice of using formal childcare and can be not using it or one, two, three, up to three days per week, which is kind of common in the Netherlands. A lot of people, as you probably know, work part-time in the Netherlands. And so it's kind of uncommon for people to use more than three days of childcare per week. So, but it also means that we have quite a big choice set. So if we have a couple with uh, so two partners and have young children, then basically they have like six choices for one partner, six for the other and four childcare choices. So 144 choices. So that's where it becomes computationally intensive. But, uh, but the computer is, uh, uh, how do you say, <laughs> not a problem for the computer. So for the deterministic part, we use a translog specification for preferences. So we have a log and income and leisure of, uh, of both uh, partners and also we allow for interaction terms. The render part, we use this extreme value uh, distribution type one, which results in the multinomial logic model for the observed choices. And we allow both for observed heterogeneity, so uh, in leisure and out of childcare, but also we allow for heterogeneity in fixed cost of work and also in the use of childcare. And this, these, these, uh, these may differ by age of the parents, the ethnicity, their education level and whether they live in an urban or rural area. And we also model in different ways and observe that is an 80. So in the, like the baseline, we use random preference that is an 80, but we also experimented with latent classes, <laughs> which is really like a no-go, I would say, for a lot of other people, because it was like, it took maybe three months to converge with the data set that we had. And at the end of the day, the results were very similar to the base specification. So the data that we use uh, is from the so-called labor market panel, which is a database from Statistics Netherlands. The backbone of that is actually the labor force survey. So from, we use 20 years of labor force survey. And from the labor force survey, we have the, the level of education for everybody. And then uh, we merge that with all kinds of administrative data that we have from other sources on the age, ethnicity, whether they have children, their how much if they work and how much they work and also on their on their wages and also if they use formal child care for all the individual for the older children in the household so the full sample is pretty big so it's 1.2 million individuals and that's nice because that also allows us to look at uh, responses for all kinds of subgroups for example 
we are also particularly interested in, in lone parents. And we might be interested, for example, in lone parents that have a young child versus lone parents that have an old child. And if you have a big sample size, then you can look at all these separate, uh, all these subgroups separately. So that's also what we do. And in addition, we use the advanced uh, tax benefit calculator, MIMOSI, to calculate disposable income and taxes. That's actually like the net transfer from the government in all the different choice options that individuals have. So we can also, we can not only look at um, uh, the effects on the incomes, but we can also look at the effect on the government budget, both before and after behavioral changes. So that's for the... The structural model then so we estimate preferences so preference for leisure income etc uh, but they are often very difficult to interpret so the way to look at uh, what these preferences implies is that we normally look at elasticities uh, for example labor supply elasticities and i'll show you uh, two of the key findings that uh, that are also in the paper <clears throat> so we measure the responsiveness of labor supply by so-called labor supply elasticity uh, which is like the percentage change in hours worked if we increase uh, wages by 1% and how we do this in practice that we increase wages by 10% and then we see how much the hours work change and then what we find consistent with a lot of other uh, research for example by uh, Olivier Barguet and Andreas Peichel is that there's large differences in responses by different demographic groups so singles versus couples uh, households with children houses uh, without children and also, <laughs> also in line with a lot of <clears throat> Sorry, in line with a lot of other research that we find that most people re respond in the uh, decision to participate, but not so much in the hours worked per week. So let me show you some of these labor supply elasticities for different groups. I focus on couples, so we, we model more groups, but just to, to, uh, to limit uh, the amount of slides somewhat. So first, let me show you the results for men. So we typically say, I think that of men as being rather insensitive. And that is also true in terms of labor supply. So what you can see here is the, the labor supply responses of men when we increase their, their, their wages. And actually, if we increase their wage by 1%, their hours work increase only very little. So like the total effect is given by the, by the dark bars, so the, the black bars. And you can see that, for example, for men in couples that don't have children, the most left uh, bars, they have an elasticity of 0 0.05. So if we would increase their wage, let's say by 10%, they would increase the hours work by only half a percent. So very small. And the same is basically true also when they have children. So when they have small children, or even when the children get, or also when the children get bigger, again, the, the supply elasticities remain relatively little. And what you can also see for this group is that we then decompose this total effect on the intensive margin, whether people decide to participate and the intensive margin the hours work per week by the individuals that work, then we see that most of the response is on the extensive margin, so the light gray bars. So for men, it seems like uh, there's not, uh, not much action when we change their financial incentives, at least in terms of hours worked. It's different for women. So we find, uh, first of all, that the elasticities are typically larger for women, especially women in couples. Uh, and also we found a big difference by the age of the child. So, so start again from the left, and this is the group that doesn't have a child. And here we see that the elasticity is somewhat bigger, but still not substantial. So the total effect is maybe something close to 0 0.15. The biggest effect is still on the intensive margin, but these elasticities are still much smaller than when we consider the women uh, in couples that have, a, that have a child, especially when they have a young child. So we distinguish between children zero to three, and, uh, and how to have a child uh, 4 to 11. So children go to uh, primary school in the Netherlands at uh, age four. So that's why we make this distinction. And then we can see that both for, for both these groups that have a young child, there's actually quite a large response on close to 50, like uh, the cystic rises up to zero, close to 0 0.5. And again, most of it is on the extensive margin, but for this group also there's some effect on the intensive margin. So if you think about policy and financial incentives is probably, not only important to stimulate uh, these sec women with young children to participate, but also to stim stimulate them in working more hours per week, which is yeah, a big issue in the Netherlands given the large share of part-time workers. Okay, so those are the, <laughs> the behavioral responses we find for the structural model. And then the next thing, so what we did is that we, we actually, we did three quasi-experimental studies. Uh, and I just want to present one comparison that's in the paper. The other two are also discussed in the paper. And this is where we, we, we had some major reforms in the Netherlands uh, between 2005 and 2009. 
in terms of childcare subsidies. So the uh, the the cost of uh, childcare to parents um, it dropped from let's say 40% of the full cost to less than 80% of the full cost. And public expenditures went from one billion euro to three billion euro, so quite a big increase. And at the same time, at the same time there was also an introduction and extension of a secondary earned te earned tax credit also targeted at uh, secondary earners with young children. So basically the same group that also is targeted by childcare subsidies. And then we did this different, different analysis and uh, looked at the effects for different groups. So uh, mothers and fathers, and also by age of the youngest child. And that's what you see in the last column. Um, uh, so that was from the natural experiment. And then what we did is that we used the structural model to predict the uh, the effects on the participation hours worked of these groups as well, and then we compare the two outcomes, and then we see whether the structural model does a good job in predicting these results from the natural experiment. And then, well, depends on what you think is good or not good. I guess most of us here are also empirical economists, so things typically get a little bit messy. But uh, so start, for example, with the women with a youngest child, uh, zero to three. Then the structural model predicts uh, that. Their participation rate would increase by 3.5 percentage points, whereas in the different diff analysis is two percentage points. So it's actually quite a bit bigger from the structural model, but at least well in the same ballpark. Uh, it gets better when we look at the hours work per week. So the structural model predicts 1.2 hours per week. In the different diff analysis, only 1.1, but those are already very close. The participation rate of men is also pretty good. So both both approaches basically predict almost no change in the participation rate of the fathers. Uh, the only real problem you could say is with the hours work per week by men, where the structural model predicts a, a small increase, whereas in the different diff analysis, we actually found a decrease, although it's only borderline uh, significant, so significant at the 10% level. So we tried, we played around a bit with the structural model, for example, the interaction term of leisure of the mother and the father, and things like that, but never got the structural model predict this. Uh, so it's, I would say it's still something for future research. And then if we go to the older group, so that they have a youngest child, 4 to 11, it's, yeah, it's still pretty, again, it's pretty close. So the participation rate of women, 1.7 compared to 2.2. The hours worked are, again, also pretty close. And for men, again, almost we predict almost no change in participation rate or structural model, but we still find a slight decrease in the different diff analysis, which we don't find in the structural model. But overall, we would say, like, uh, so we have two other comparisons with other reforms uh, that the model does a pretty good job in predicting the, uh, the effects of these uh, of these reforms. So then we use the power of the structural model to do counterfactual policy analysis. And so I, I want to present results for two sets of simulations. First of all, the small reforms. Well, I thought presenting a big table is not so attractive for you. So for the small reforms, let me just informally say what comes out of the simulations. Well, as we probably expect if we change the marginal tax rates this has only a limited effect on hours worked and that's because this intensive margin is relatively in, uh, unresponsive to uh, financial incentives uh, the effects are bigger if you change the part so-called participation tax rate so that's like the the taxes you pay when you start working minus the benefits that you lose um, so for example we call the city simulations where we reduce welfare benefits and then we have pretty big effects especially for lone parents, but also you can increase the earned income tax credit, for example, at the bottom of the labor market. And then again, you find some relatively large effects, especially when compared to changes in marginal tax rates. So it seems like um, changing participation tax rate, participation tax rate is more effective than marginal tax rates. And in particular, when these changes in participation tax rates are targeted at uh, women with young children. And so we already saw two uh, examples of those. So first of all, the secondary earned tax credit, which is, uh, has really big one of, has been one of the major changes we've seen in the Netherlands in, in policy making. So, so that's also relatively effective in terms of additional hours per additional euro spent. And the same is also true to some extent to childcare subsidies. But here there's one uh, uh, one asterisk you could say that uh, it's still more costly than the secondary secondary earner tax credit. And that's because there's essentially there's like a, a leakage of this reform in the, in the sense that if you reduce the cost of formal childcare, people will not only work more hours, but they will also start using more formal instead of informal care. And this is particularly relevant for the Netherlands, where a lot of people work part time. So a lot of people take care of their of the children of, uh, of relatives or, or friends. And um, so this was like a, a very big pool of informal care. And also a lot of that 
has been formalized, so to say, by this reform. So in that sense, it's, in terms of hours worked, it's less effective than this secondary earned tax credit. Then to the final uh, final slide. Then I look at some some bigger reforms. Um, good to say. So one of the nice things about the structural model linked to the tax benefit calculators that we can always look at the budgetary effect. So here we simulate reforms that are budgetary neutral at least before people change their behavior. And so I, I picked a few uh, simulations that I thought were interesting because there are a lot of people discuss them in the international literature. So we look at flat tax simulations, basic income and joint taxation. So let me start with the flat tax uh, simulation. So what we do there is that we, we have a progressive tax system in the Netherlands where the marginal tax rate increases from 36% to 52% at the top, at least at the time uh, of the data set. And what we do in this simulation that we, we, we make a flat tax. So basically everybody pays a tax of almost marginal tax rates of uh, 40% basically. And then uh, what you see is that indeed hours worked uh, increases as some people proponents of flat tax reforms uh, claim, but we can also see a downside at the bottom of the table. And that's the Gini coefficient, which measures uh, the level of income inequality and a higher G Gini coefficient means higher inequality that also increases by 5%. So there's an increase in hours work, but at the expense of more income inequality. And that's because marginal tax rates at the top are going down. So the rich are getting richer. Marginal tax rates at the bottom are going up. So the, the poor are getting poorer. So we thought to make a fair comparison of the flat tax with the current system, we're going to do a Gini neutral. So what, what do we mean by Gini neutral is that we basically, we give everybody a lump sum in this scenario of uh, close to 2000 euros. And we finance that lump sum by a higher marginal tax rate, higher flat tax. So the flat tax then has to go from 40 to 45%. And if we do that, then, well, first of all, this is what we put in the model, right? So that the Gini coefficient wouldn't change, at least not before behavioral changes. And then if we actually do that, so we consider a Gini neutral reform, then actually hours worked decline. Um, and that is consistent with a lot of uh, other papers that show that it's uh, typically marginal tax rates, the optimal uh, shape of that should be a U shape and not, not a flat profile. And that's also what we find in this simulation. So then I still have time, Milena. You're out of time, so but uh, if oh. you want to conclude with the basic income, I think that yeah. is of interest uh, for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, just two, two remarks maybe then about the basic income. So we give a, a certain amount to, to everybody and basically what you can see that this has a very large negative effect on hours worked. So total declines by more than 5%. Uh, and it's mostly because of the financing. So tax rates have to go up to finance this basic income. And finally, I just wanted to say about joint taxation. So the Netherlands went from joint to individual taxation in the 80s, and, uh, but it's still present in the US and in Germany. And then if you have joint taxation, it means that the marginal tax rate of the secondary earner will be the same as the primary earner. But because the secondary earner responds respons much more to this marginal tax rate, it actually reduces uh, labor supply. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Egbert. This was a very interesting uh, and uh, policy relevant presentation. Um, we have time for uh, maybe one uh, question. On the topic. Then, uh, um, maybe uh, uh, a rather uh, um, um, comment uh, for, from my side. So how do the, uh, the universal basic income uh, estimates that you show compare to the experimental evidence that exists from Finland? And there's a couple from the US uh, last, right. I think. Yeah, it's very hard to come across a good basic income experiment recently, but the ones from the 70s and before and from more recently from yeah. Canada. So, yeah. I don't know, it depends on your reading of the literature, but my reading of it is there's this nice paper, I think, in Journal of Human Resources in the 90s, which concluded it was also like about 5 percentage point drop in the U.S. experiments of uh, labor supply. So, but then some people say that this is not a big number. <laughs> I think compared to all the other simulations that we do at the Institute, this is a huge drop, so to say. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. it seems to be consistent with that, uh, but most people... So we also did this simulation in two parts where we just give the additional basic income, but don't increase taxes. And then the effects are actually not that big. So you get only an income mm. effect. 
Uh, but it's actually the financing that's the most detrimental to labor supply. So you have to find mm. this. So in this simulation, tax rates have to go to 57%. So the baseline is like close to 40%. Mm. So huge mm. increase in marginal tax rates. And that's why it's so disadvantageous for labor supply. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Maybe there are effects that we do not cover and do not capture in our setup. So. Yeah, this is very fascinating. Yeah, so the, the Finland one also looked at other outcomes related to mental health and, and all kinds of other benefits. So it's, um, exactly, it's a trade-off exactly. uh, indeed. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really, really fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, and uh, we are now going to move to our uh, last presentation by, by Enrico Retore and uh, co-authors. Um, and the uh, title of this paper is The Chips Are Down, The Influence of Family on Children's Trust Formation. Um, the paper is with Sara Donini and Corrado Giulietti. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. So let me set it up. Okay, this way. Fine, so... Um, Corrado is here with us. Uh, Sara is taking care of uh, her teaching duties, not here with us. So this is about uh, uh, trust uh, in others. So there's a, here is a, a quote from uh, Arrow explaining why taking care of trust is relevant. Essentially, the point is that uh, uh, you would not start uh, any business in the absence of uh, a bit of trust in others. Uh, well, uh, I suspect that uh, if in the absence of at least a bit of trust in others, we would not even wake up in the morning. So not surprisingly, there's uh, plenty of evidence, plenty of literature on the effect of trust uh, in for economic development, innovation, individual performance, and so on. So the point is uh, uh, what, about the process of the formation of trust, where trust uh, uh, comes from. Uh, and uh, there are theoretical work on this. Um, there's a pioneering paper by Bizin and Verdier, and uh, emphasizing the role of intergenerational transmission of values in general, in particular, the transmission of trust. And there's also uh, some empirical literature on this. Um, I think the reference paper is by Domen and co authors of the Review of Economic uh, Studies 2012. What they do is very simple. They use data from the German Social Economic Panel, a cross section from the German Social Economic Panel. They have information on trust of uh, kids, TC, and trust of their parents, fathers and mothers. And they just run a regression uh, of uh, trust of kids on trust of uh, their parents. What we add here is, uh, well, first point, uh, uh, we use longitudinal information. So we draw data again from ZOE, the German Social Economic Panel, but this time we use uh, a panel, a three-wave panel, three observation over time. And uh, the point we make is that there is a, a large fraction of the observed variability of trust is due to poor noise, just noise. And uh, we show this is irrelevant to the transmission process. And the second point we make is that this noise in the observable trust uh, uh, hides a striking fact. After netting out this, uh, let's name it measurement error noise, the trust of kids is close to exactly determined by observable and unobservable features of the family where they grow, where they grow up. So this is akin to the story told by Solon and co-authors uh, some 30 years uh, ago, talking about the intergenerational transmission of the economic status. Uh, so why we uh, show that uh, uh, having longitudinal information is important. So as I told you, we took uh, three waves of panel data from ZOEP, years 2003, 2008, and 2013. And what we showed there, our first result is that the empirical autocovariance function of trust, the autocovariance of trust over time is consistent with a simple model for the observable level of trust of individual i at time t. 
So the observer trust T here is a, 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 a time invariant individual component, time invariant, which we name permanent trust plus a transient shock B here. So the transient shock is uh, uncorrelated over time. So it is just noise, as I told you. And so the permanent trust, the individual time invariant component is uh, summarizing the lasting belief on whether individual I is uh, um, uh, trust other people. The transient shock is, think of it as uh, either an attention the day in which they are interviewed, they do not take care in the way they answer to the question on trust, or maybe minor event taking place the day in which they go through the interview. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, this trend and shock is irrelevant for the lasting belief. So the point we make is that we should model the dependence of the permanent trust of kids on the permanent trust of their parents. And this model, this simple model, individual fixed effect time invariant plus shocks, uh, this model holds for fathers, mothers, and for kids. This is the evidence we provide in the paper. So implication of this decomposition of observable trust. So first of all, it is very straightforward to derive the variance of the permanent trust and the variance of the trend and shock from the autocovariance function. And what we show is that at least 50%, but let's say up to 60% of the observable variability of trust is due to the trend and shock. So we are not talking about a negligible component of noise. This is definitely relevant empirically. And the second point we make, of course, is that it is only the permanent component of trust, the long lasting belief relevant for intergenerational transmission. And we show this is testable. And by the way, not rejected by our data. So the econometric implication is very simple. So the feasible regression we are able to run is the same by domain and quarters, the observable trust of kids on observable trust of their parents. But this is not the regression we should run. What we should run is the regression of permanent trust of kids on permanent trust of fathers and mothers. So here, there is a major measurement error problem because the, you see that the two explanatory variables to the right are affected by large measurement error. Uh, and the second point, is that the error term in the feasible regression includes a large component of measurement error. So the R square, you evaluate how the regression is downward biased due to the presence of the measurement error. So this solution we propose is straightforward. To, re to identify, to estimate beta one and beta two, what we do is to use, since we have available three waves of data, we use the lag value of the observable trust of fathers and mothers as an instrumental variable for the current time t observable uh, trust of fathers and mothers. Um, the final point is that uh, we uh, um, we use the subsample of households in our ZOEP sample, the subsample of households with at least two kids, at least two kids to estimate a transmission equation, including a family-specific unobservable effect. Basically, we add this alpha i here, which is an unobservable component shared by um, kids living in the same household. Okay, So this way, we are able to decompose the total effect of the family household on the permanent trust of kids into a component due to the permanent trust of the parents plus something else shared by siblings living growing up in the same in the same house so here are the results yeah so uh we we sample selection is uh, old couples taking part continuously into the survey in 2003 8 13 with at least one biological child age 17 or older in 2013, the last wave. 
Uh, so this way we we are able to observe the trust of both parents three times in the three years. So this is why we can use lag trust as an instrument for current trust. So we end up with 1,652 kids within 1,100 families. So the empirical trust we make use of is the same as in domain and co-authors, principal component of uh, out of three questions on trust. And here are the results. Um, including control variables, not including control variables, but the story is very much the same. So the first point, you see that there is a clear difference, at least for mothers, using the OLS and using the IV. Uh, the, it is, I mean, for mothers, it is approximately two times larger when we use IV. It doesn't change for fathers, much smaller. It doesn't change. It might seem puzzling, but uh, I mean, there's no time, I'm sorry, here to go into the details, but this is uh, there is an old result by Henri Tail showing that when you have in a regression more than one explanatory variable, all of them affected by measurement error, the standard results that the measurement error is attenuating the estimate towards zero no longer holds. So this is why for fathers, uh, the coefficient is nearly unchanging moving from the OLS to the IV. Uh, here is the overall identification test for the validity of our instrument, and you see that the p-value is close to one, so there's no evidence at all rejecting the validity of our, of our instrument available. So accounting for measurement error of parents, the permanent trust makes the difference. The IV for mothers is two times larger than the OLS, as I told you. Uh, the role of mother is much, much stronger. The father's is nearly irrelevant. And as a side result, we also show that the permanent trust of fathers and mothers is highly correlated. The correlation coefficient is approximately 0 0.6. So the final point is that we decompose the total variability of the kids trust in components. So this is 1.4, 1.5 is the total variability. And the variance of the trend and shock is close to one. So two thirds of the variability is due to shock. So the remaining 0.5 approximately, so the variability of the permanent component is due uh, to approximately 20% of it is due to the permanent trust of uh, parents. And uh, the 60% is due to other household environment, unobservable characteristics of the household, and the residual component is approximately 20%. So the R square, so to speak, in the unfeasible regression is as large as 80%. Okay, so the household environment explain 80% of the variability of the permanent trust of kids. Summing up, I'm going to the end. So first point, longitudinal information is a key asset to study the intergenerational transmission of trust because it is crucial to disentangle the two components of observable trust, the permanent component and the trend in shock. Um, the results, most of the observability of children trust is pure noise, point one. Second, the permanent trust of parents account for a small fraction of the variance of the kids' permanent trust, let's say 20% approximately. The contribution of other family-specific and observable is much larger, let's say 60% roughly. And so taken together, the household environment accounts for approximately 80%. So this is why we say that the household environment nearly determined the value of the permanent trust of kids. And uh, if we miss to recognize the size of the measurement error, this R square, 80%, would drop to 30%. So this is why it is important to distinguish between, per empirically important to distinguish between permanent trust and uh, uh, 
uh, trained in shocks. The direct transmission from parents to kids uh, plays a minor role when 20% as a sold. All the rest is something else in the household, something we are unable to investigate on with our data. We made some attempts on this, trying to understand whether it is the interaction between siblings to matter for this uh, additional component. But with our sample, this is, I mean, the results we got are entirely uh, unreliable. So we, in the end, we prefer to drop it from the paper. I mean, but here it is clear that if, uh, if we are right in, in our result, there's plenty of room for uh, other research in the field. That's it on my side, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Enrico, for this uh, um, to the point and clear presentation. Uh, we have some time for questions and comments from the audience. Yeah, uh, Max was first. Yeah, uh, first of all, ciao Enrico, very nice to see you. Um, no quick, question. <laughs> um, quick question, I, mean, I have several questions, but um, first of all, do you see a gender effect in the sense of, I mean, does the gender of the child matters? Do, do yeah, boys? Maybe. Maybe there is an, in the appendix, there is a table showing the breakdown by males and females kids. There is a bit of difference. And uh, well, you can imagine, the transmission uh, is stronger uh, to female kids. The parameter of, of, uh, of a parent's transmission is a bit larger for female kids. Right. And the second thing, which is, I, I, I'm sorry, I should have seen the paper, but I no, don't worry. I, I, I confess my thinking. But it's it's something that is going on. Is it, it has some prominence at, at least down here, which is um, uh, same same sex parents. Whether you still find, I mean, it's probably GSOP is probably the, the, the wrongest possible um, database for for this sort of stuff. But whether you have that information. Um, or whether there is a, an available database with 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 sufficient observations to see whether a similar effect uh, with with such a difference in in roles occurs also in in uh, uh, same sex um, sort of families um, as that would identify you know clearly whether you know the role matters or it is just just yeah, yeah. time spent with it. Yeah, yeah, this is precisely what we attempted with our data. So exploiting the difference in age between siblings, exploiting the difference in gender between siblings. But as I told you, it is the estimate we got are uh, too much imprecise. So we prefer to drop it from the paper. I mean, we, we need a much larger sample to do that, no doubt. Thank you very much. Further questions uh, for Enrico? Well, maybe uh, can I ask one? So you talk here yeah, specifically, and you were very precise uh, about speaking uh, about vertical transmission, but you also mentioned this uh, paper by Bissin Vigier, and they also talk about horizontal transmission, which is something that we know very little about in general, about how this peer interaction might be might be working here. So can you say something about that? Yeah, I mean, the I think it is, uh, if I got your question, it's similar to the question by Max. So investigating on the interaction between uh, siblings, okay, because it is clear that there is something happening within the household. This is the meaning of that family specific component. And uh, so what exactly it is, we don't know. I, I admit, I confess. Yeah, my, my, my preferred culprit is uh, interaction between uh, siblings. So uh, if, if I could, I would try investigating in that direction, no doubt. And now I meant uh, more specifically about the, the interaction with peers uh, and society at large. So how would you go about uh, pointing your finger on, on that one? Yeah, 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 of course, of course it might be. But, but even in that case, it should be something shared by siblings. 
uh, interaction with people around, but the two siblings should have the, exactly the same interaction to explain that uh, large uh, effect of the family specific component. That this yeah. is my. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can add, Enrico, Milano, mm -hmm. we do in the paper, we control. For, so we have some retrospective variables that uh, tells us information of um, of the environment around when the kids grew up, and mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, we can chip in uh, pretty much this is also borrowed from the paper by Domen and uh, and others, uh, basically is to control actually for the average level of trust uh, at, mm -hmm. when the kids grew up. So it's a kind of proxy uh, for for capturing peer effects. Of course, it would have been ideal to have information on school backgrounds and trying to understand you know whether the trust of my peers affected mm -hmm. by information of my trust but as Enrico said one one important thing is that in the model when we look at the, within the family effect we're basically comparing kids within the same family so we don't know mm -hmm. what that is but we control for that unobserved effect and that yeah. unobserved effect explain the bulk of the variance and that mm -hmm. I think that no, it makes sense. I think that Luca has a final point. Yes, just um, just a clarification on the empirical uh, strategy. Yeah. Uh, I find it um, e extremely convincing, but I was just wondering, why did you not uh, decide to filter out the transient component by doing a fixed effects regression um, and predicted the individual effects, essentially? um filtering out the uh the residual from the from the fixed effects regression what would be the relative because benefits the, the point is that disadvantages a family, a, a family fixed effect would kill the trust of parents no no an individual fixed effect uh but do you mean a fixed effect for for family uh fixed sorry maybe you know, individual. Maybe I misunderstood you, but you have uh, uh, panel data at the individual level. Is that correct? Right, right. But uh, the kids, uh, I mean, the parents are observed due to the structure of Zoeb. Hmm? The trust is collected only on people at least seventeen. So. It happens that we do observe the trust for parents in all the three ways, but we do not observe the trust of, of all kids over three periods. Ah, because see. some of the kids are observed mm -hmm. just in the last wave. Ah, I see. Because of the age limit in the in the in the zone for collecting mm -hmm. information on uh, on uh, trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, this is this has been a very interesting session, and uh, really, it, I think it highlights the breadth uh, of of topics that, uh, that the general population economics covers, and the excellence of uh, the research that is published there. So, um, I would like to thank first of all um, all of the participants in the session, all of the presenters. Uh, for for uh, the excellent presentations, the questions and comments uh, that that were shared uh, in in this session, and of course, I would like to thank uh, the editor in chief, Klaus Zimmermann, who is uh, of course uh, the uh, organizer of this fantastic uh, event, uh, twenty four hour conference over three days uh, with signature sessions for the general population economics. And congratulations on the thirty. Fifth birthday of uh, of the German population economics and happy birthday also to Klaus Zimmermann. Thank you all very much.